Uh, hi, uh, my name is Freddie DeBoer, uh, and I am a doctoral candidate at Purdue University, where I study uh, utilizing textual processing and uh, computational linguistic techniques in literacy education, uh, and I write for uh, my own website. Um, and I am Alexis Madrum. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic. I have sort of a weak academic affiliation with uh, UC Berkeley in the customs program, which is the uh, Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk to you today, uh, Alexis, uh, because uh, you, you write a lot, of, not just about tech, but also about, a lot about like our attitudes towards tech and how we sort of uh, talk about uh, technology. And it occurred to me recently that, um, you know, sort of online only technology media, you know, like sort of gadget and technology media that has sort of become a mature industry just in terms of its age. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the biggest websites now are, um, are over 10 years old and some of them are approaching 15 years old or older. Um, and so, which is very weird for me to sort of think about it, them being that, that age. But um, so I wanted to sort of get your sort of assessment about of sort of where we are, sort of where the industry is. I'll, so I'll sort of show my cards and say that um, I think like in just in terms of like investigative reporting, I think that um, it's really amazing the amount of information that people find and the sort of diligence that they, that they show in sort of getting scoops and sort of finding out in just sort of the old kind of old school kind of like brick and mortar reporting style of journalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, also think yeah. that. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And I also think that like the the amount of consumer information uh, that's out there. It's just incredible, right? Like I just, I think that if you're shopping for a laptop, the amount of info that you have on your fingertips is just amazing. But I also am consistently frustrated by sort of what I see sort of as like the culture of a lot of tech reporting, which is like, I would call like a culture of hype or a culture of woo woo. So I just wanted to see what you thought about the, the, the state of the industry right now. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the one of my colleagues, a guy named Rob Meyer, I think kind of described this best actually before he started working for us, which is that what used to be the tech beat is basically gone. Um, mm -hmm. That what you used to do, you know, in like 2008 or 2009, you know, if you were in Gadget or you were Gizmodo or whatever, you would take all of these devices that were coming out from all of these different manufacturers um, and you would essentially try to uh, get their specs up as quickly as possible, and you would try and sort of like pronounce on them as good or bad or whatever. Um, but that game just doesn't work anymore. Like no mm. one, no one cares. There's basically two dominant smartphone manufacturers. Everyone knows what their phones are. Everyone has a camp. And while sometimes it maybe makes sense to walk through um, a uh, you know the new iOS software or something like you can't actually create uh, a website based on that anymore. Um, mm. Like all of the stuff that they used to do has essentially been compressed into the wire cutter, which is uh, mm. a site that basically provides one recommendation um, for, for every type of tech product category that you could imagine. And that for that is, I mean, you know, Brian Lamb who runs that site used to run, uh, or founded that site, used to run Gizmodo, and that used mm -hmm. to be the game, right? I mean, it's just like, it's about gadgets, it's about hardware. Um, and sort of secondarily, um, there were these sort of social media things um, that were going on as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the you kind of had a second generation where you had like Mashable and these places that just relentlessly covered social media. And I think that we're, um, we're kind of on the backside of that wave as the sort of first sort of hardware driven tech blog writing thing fell apart, then people sort of picked up with social media at that point and said like, okay, here we go. Now we've got, uh, this, this new thing. We've got, um, uh, you know, we, we've got social media to cover. And not only that, if we're covering social media, it's extra viral because it's using and talking about the same mechanisms that then, um, uh, we'll take our stories and, and expand them into previously unheard of audience expansion. And so one of the things that makes tech super weird right now and, and kind of all media is subject to the same forces is that the numbers that we're talking about um, are just huge. You know, I mean, the Atlantic has a subscriber base of 500,000 people, 
but maybe 15 million visitors to the website every month. 16 right. million, 15 million, something like that. Um, the the relationships you have with those readers is really different. Um, you know, if you look at the internal report that came out about the New York Times today, um, half of their homepage traffic has fallen. Uh, so they've gone from 160 million to less than 80 million. And I think it's um, that that's still a lot of people, <laughs> but uh, but it's if the New York Times can't hold the line, if they can't buck the homepages are dying trend. Then, then everybody else is really in trouble. And so what does that mean? It means you get all of your traffic through these sort of social avenues. And I think that um, where that directly intersects with the type of coverage that people do, um, there are really high investment social plays that work really well. And I think that's why you see really well-reported pieces these days. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you've got this great, if you've got a scoop, you've got great information, that will travel really well in the social world. And you'll get tons of traffic from it, and the incentives align so that you want tons of traffic. Um, uh, unfortunately, like most of the time, people don't have a scoop. Most of the time, people haven't done. Uh, and I love brick and mortar journalism. I actually love that. I think people normally say shoe leather, but I think brick and mortar is like way better. Um, mm -hmm. And so, if you've got that, and you wake up in the morning and you work for a tech site, like what are you going to do? Um, and so, I think what ends up happening is people repackage sort of the viral bits of the day, whatever those happen to be. Um, and most of the time, in order to get things to travel in a social media world, you need like really strong valence on the piece. And so on the one side, you've got like Valley Wag, which is sort of relying on massive negative valence around people's feelings around Silicon Valley um, mm -hmm. for all kinds of good reasons. And on the other side, you've got the sort of, um, uh, you've got the promoters, you've got the sort of enthusiast press, as Tim Malley likes to call them, who are just going to say, you know, Google wants to put balloons in the air uh, to provide uh, internet for, you know, Kenyan villagers, like, with like exactly that kind of creepy framing. And mm -hmm. they'll go like, yay, isn't Google doing amazing things? Um, and it's a, it's a, it's, it makes for a tough world because when you have a piece or you have pieces that, um, are, are subtle or you're trying to get at sort of complex dynamics in a way that doesn't lend itself to immediate emotion filled reframing, uh, the thing breaks down and you get mm -hmm. bad stuff, uh, in the, in the, like you can't, you'll invest tons of time and then not have it succeed or you can invest very little time but think through the sort of emotional mechanics and do really well and right. so that's why I, I i think you really correctly identify that the the tech press is incredibly uneven right now um mm. in that there are probably more good tech stories coming out now than there were um you know 10 years ago or 15 years ago and having read a lot of old new york times i can guarantee that there's like a lot of very bad tech coverage in the old days um but it's bad when it goes bad. It's bad in this really specific way, I think, um, and it's pretty terrible <laughs> for right. um, sort of global or or local understanding of technological issues. Right. I, you know, it's interesting. I remember a piece um, maybe five years ago now, which are, you know obviously is a lifetime uh, in the sort of context we're talking about. But it was all about this Engadget and Gizmodo motor rivalry, and mm -hmm. I remember. I think that they told the story about someone like literally breaking into a showroom at one of the big tech expos in order to get the scoop before somebody else. And it's incredible how that that sort of hunger to be the first um, or at least like that business model isn't viable anymore because everything breaks. Uh, I mean, on Twitter or on Facebook first. And it, there's just so many people looking for these things that you can't reliably expect to be the sort of the website that gets them first. Uh, oh, yeah, I thought, totally. I thought it was, I think it's interesting when you contrast, when you talk about the success of the wire cutter, because I mean, the wire cutter is the complete opposite, right? Like the wire cutter, I mean, it's remarkable to have a, a successful technology website that sometimes goes days without posting anything new. Right. Mm -hmm. And like their whole thing is by being just insanely thorough, you know, like, um, it's not timely. Like you won't get their review first. In fact, their whole thing is to wait until other reviews come out so that they can aggregate all these reviews. 
that's it is really uh, interesting how they've been successful with that. And of course, part of it is they have these Amazon affiliate links, which help right, exactly. sort of pro- provides this alternative revenue stream. So it's not just advertising. Um, but yeah, I mean, it occurs to me that that is just not scalable. That most uh, places are not going to have be able to invest, you know, to, to be able to take the time and have the patience to like let a person review things for like a month or more and right. wait on that kind of content. It's just not possible at this point. I think. Well, I think I've always just like uh, you know the the really sort of fundamental question is like why does all this tech coverage exist? <laughs> like I think mm-hmm. like there's a there's a real question and. Um, I think that the answer is possibly like more depressing than most people would want to admit, which is basically that lots of companies want to attach themselves to the idea of innovation, um, mm-hmm. whether or not that's what they're actually doing and, or, or whether or not like that is a, a positive value in and of itself, like just the idea that you're coming up with, with new stuff. And so if you look at advertisers on tech sites, many tech companies don't do traditional advertising that supports this kind of media. Um, the people who do it are large companies who want to be perceived as innovative. And there's just, you, there's just enormous, basically never ending demand for technology coverage to run your ads next to. So that when somebody is reading about the new thing, they see the ad from the old guys, you know? Right. The Um, thing is, is, there's just so much content in every field right now. And I mean, in, I mean, in tech especially, but it's like, I sometimes I, I just like, I mean, I'm a, a person who's sort of had this kind of pessimistic attitude towards like how long we can continue to sort of keep a certain small class of online writers employed. But then again, you know, just like every day, it seems like somebody's launching some new website. And because I, I like writers, that makes me happy. Um, I just, you know, it's just, it's, it appears that people's, uh, <laughs> demand for this is just insatiable. I mean, like, it, it seems like, you know, like you look like a website like The Verge, which is still pretty new. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, before that launched, I would have said, well, you know, is there really space out there with your, with, you know, your sort of sites like Engadget and Gizmodo, but also your CNETs and also, you know, mm-hmm. but it's, Wired, I mean, it, it, right. It, yeah, but it appears to be doing great. But I mean, the, the question, you know, is just, if they were going to get to like a certain saturation point where it, you know, the, the numbers, I mean, obviously in a lot of fields, media wise, the numbers aren't making sense already. Um, mm-hmm. If I had to pick a field that I thought would be able to maintain healthy, it would be tech because, uh, because the industry has this need that you've just identified and because there is so much interest and people care about this stuff so much. Um, so I don't know. I guess I, I have this kind of, I have no reason to think that there's like a structural problem in the economics of it right now, right. but I wonder how long can we continue to sort of expand the coverage without getting to this fundamental, you know, problem of demand, of sort of supply outrunning demand, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious, like how you see your writing, your blog, and maybe people like you, you know, uh, like, mm super sophisticated um what a, a friend of mine calls um like people who who know sts science and technology studies and are willing to do the work of kind of popularizing the modes of thought that go into it because i think at least for me when i first started working on my well my first and only book uh like in 2007 2008 the whole field of sts just blew my mind and I've, I've we've wanted to bring basically like pop STS to the Atlantic. And, and I kind of think of what we do as like an STS blog as opposed to a technology blog. But the people who do it best, of course, are the actual practitioners in, um, in academia uh, who know this stuff cold and can bring all of these different um, optics uh, to, to bear. So, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm curious how you see your role and um and how you see other sts people and people who've been trained some of these methods um doing this work yeah so it's interesting i mean I, and i i mean i hate to be the kind of person i i, I find I'm, I'm always in this position like when i complain about coverage of comic book movies and things where i kind of have to pre-announce that i like i mean i love co- you know i read comics <laughs> and i watch comic book movies and then i sort right. of shit on the field of sort of and the same thing with tech where like 
Look, I, like, I mean, in, in the in the simplest sense, my existence as an academic couldn't exist without the internet, right? So like, or, or these technologies. So I, you know, um, the typical sort of research day for me is to get up and I access online a giant corpus of texts that have been put together by researchers all over the world from student writers all over the world. And it's all very easy to sort of uh, standardize those texts and automate the collection process and bring them together. And then I analyze them with tools that I downloaded for free and can access for free that uh, researchers have uh, have created free of charge uh, in order to do this kind of automated computer textual processing that I'm interested in. Um, so, I mean, what I'm doing simply would not be possible without these technologies that I'm talking about. So I don't want to mm -hmm. be too pessimistic. Mm -hmm. um, I am kind of, kind of constitutionally a pessimist as well as a little bit of an asshole. And um, I uh, also am in a field, um, I'm sort of at this junction between literacy education and linguistics. And that's a field where um, you can sort of see how the hype cycle can cause real damage. And one of the ways in which mm -hmm. this causes real damage is, you know, the dog that hasn't barked in education reform and literacy education is the sort of predicted uh, benefits of uh, incorporating all of these technologies into the classroom. And then if you mm -hmm. look at the sort of, at the research that, you know, um, that we've been, we've been developing for, for 15 years now, it's sort of research on, you know, whether the internet will sort of have these amazing effects on people's outcomes. And generally speaking, the answer is no, right? Like these mm -hmm. technologies, they don't hurt, but they also aren't helping in the way that they've been predicted. And so then you kind of, uh, then I read in sort of elite policy circles and it's all, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation saying, well, once we have computers in every classroom or once we have this particular kind mm -hmm. of technology in every classroom, all of our problems are going to be solved. And so what I, I personally try to sort of um, tell people to slow down on the hype because it's one thing if, you know, you get a, we, if we get a little bit ahead of ourselves about like what the latest cell phone technology is going to be about, because that's, that's mostly about fun and it's about convenience and it's about sort of personal comfort. But um, education is a field where unfounded optimism about technology, technological process, uh, sort of progress has had no bullshit negative impact on policy. Mm -hmm. And, and, mm -hmm. And I think it's impossible to kind of untangle that sort of um, that optimism from the broader field of like breathlessness and hype that attends how much we sort of uh, how we talk about tech generally. Does that make sense? Oh, I, I think it makes total sense. I mean, I think from where I sit, like it, it is the sort of pushback from um, scholars of learning. <laughs> the people who studied online education around the sort of MOOC push of mm. um, what I guess is now basically a historical moment uh, of probably a year and a half ago or so, when it just felt like, man, this online education thing is booming and all these people are involved and the, you know all these schools are signing on to do these massively open online courses. And um, it, it was actually pretty remarkable. And if you look at what places like Udacity are doing now, um, they just, they, they swept into higher education, made all this noise, got all these college presidents really interested and excited, um, I assume about sort of like new revenue opportunities, but also about new educational opportunities. And then now they're gone, like two years later. Um, mm -hmm. And and sure, there's still work like continuing and the companies still exist, but but the primary thrust that MOOCs were going to be um, in epoch marking moment in education, like the invention of the university or something like the kind of um, stuff you saw the Times doing um, um, about these various online education entities um, that just like completely evaporated. And even if you say, and at which I would, that this was sort of basically like a victory for kind of um, not just common sense, but just like uh, the the like smart rhetoric on behalf of like sophisticated opponents of um, of what I would kind of like the dumb MOOC model at the very least. Um, it's still that whiplash effect has got to have all these problems 
um, I mean, it just, it's just got to the fact that people hear this thing is like, uh, gonna, gonna change everything. And then like two years later, they're like, well, actually maybe it'll just be used for like credentialing of certain skills within large companies. And you're like, wait a second, that's like mm-hmm. pretty different from, you know, every kid in Bahrain gets educated in calculus by a Harvard guy. You know what I mean? It's like a really different, uh, pitch. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, I, I mean, it's really because Online education, just uh, almost singularly among the things that I've been watching, has just collapsed um, uh, under the weight of its own hype. And so mm-hmm. in some cases, it even feels like the hype cycle hurts the technologies themselves um, because right. they don't get a chance to develop normally because everyone is sort of going nuts, expecting too much from them. Right. I mean, it, you know, with those with those things in particular, right, it's um, uh, the... So one thing that happens is that I get uh, I do get emails fairly often from people who say, hey, you know, like last last year I I did this MOOC and I got a great sort of uh, had a great time and I learned a lot. You know, I, I don't think that your your pessimism is uh, is found well founded. And so then I ask them a few questions to say, OK, so where are you in your life? Uh, where you know, did you go to college? Um, mm-hmm. Sort of like, you know, uh, what like sort of what do you do for fun? And mm-hmm. the thing is, is inevitably it's people who have already gotten a traditional education people who work in some kind of field that involves uh you know that we would call sort of uh that involves technology or information processing um mm-hmm. people who enjoy reading stuff that's published like the stuff that's published in the atlantic you know like the mm-hmm. stuff that i like to read sort of thinky kind of pieces and um these are the people who sort of do the best uh, with MOOCs are people who already have mm-hmm. the kind of soft skills of sort of of doing the reading, of being accountable, of putting in the work. Um, and those are precisely the people who need it the least, right? Right. And this is and this is one of the most depressing findings from a ton of this educational research is we tend to find as a sort of a sort of vague and general statement about a lot of educational technologies is the kids who get the most benefit from them or the young adults who get the most benefit from them are the ones who need the benefit the least because they already have the soft skills that make this possible. So if you think about somebody who comes from, you know, we call like non-traditional uh, college background, somebody whose mm-hmm. parents aren't educated, uh, who comes from uh, the bottom half of whose parents came from the bottom half of the income distribution, who mm-hmm. scored uh, below the median score of the SAT, things like that. They're precisely the people who are going to have the hardest time uh, forcing themselves to sit down at the computer every day for hours, um, sort of establishing uh, the kind of self-accountability and the habits that are necessary in order to get the most out of a MOOC. Meanwhile, the kids who go to, who already went to Harvard, the people who went to elite schools already have those soft skills. Yeah. Now, obviously, there's a ton of kind of like demographic and economic and structural things at play there. But... Um, it, it, you know, it's great. And I think it's very cool that I can go online now and I can, you know, sort of get the sort of uh, materials that were used in an MIT class. Mm-hmm. And I can sort of make myself go through the process of learning from those materials. Mm-hmm. But what what is clearer and clearer is that access to information and access to materials is not nearly as important for long term success as having the kind of soft skills and the kind of mm-hmm. meta education of being mm-hmm. able to force yourself to work uh, when you don't want to, to delay gratification and to be accountable mm-hmm. in this way. And that is exactly what online education can't provide. That's so interesting. I mean, is there is there any thought in the research that, uh, I actually don't want to use this word, but I'm going to only so that people out there know what we're talking about. Is there mm-hmm. any is there any thought that this sort of set of, practices and tools that go by the name gamification um, combined with the sort of predictive uh, algorithmic um, sort of leveling up of things um, that these can help there by sort of Mm. exploiting the same kinds of mechanisms. I mean, this this is a sort of general, I'm just describing the kind of the general principle of of the thing uh, of gamification, or is it that um, that doesn't actually work that like it, it, you would think that something like that 
um, in at least a hand-waving consultant sense would, um, would help people who might have trouble otherwise to do the work. Right. Um, but is there, is, is there literature on that or? It's uh, very early stages. It's, it's interesting that you bring that up. I, um, I hear one of my, one of my mentors, uh, is a woman named Samantha Blackman, Dr. Samantha Blackman, who, um, really does really interesting work with gamification as well as a, as a video game blogger. And, uh, I actually just sat in to observe the final projects from one of her graduate seminars, which is called games, rhetoric and play. And, uh, mm -hmm. and this, and this is what her and some of, one of my peers that are, uh, her advisees, that's sort of the question that they're asking is what can be gamified and what can't be. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think, it, I think it's too early to say for sure. I think one of the, the difficulties is certain things are more sort of easily gamified than others. Um, the general idea of saying, okay, if the hard part is getting people to kind of engage or getting people to invest, and we know that people can invest in games, I think that's very promising. The question is, as it is in almost all education research is scale. So um, is it scalable? In other words, if we do a study and it looks at sort of four weeks of class, is that going to be scalable across mm. a 16 week semester? And is that going to be, uh, you know, how scalable will those principles be not just in one class domain, right? But in a completely different domain, mm. um, it's, which that sort of remains to be seen. Um, I think that that kind of research is, is really interesting. And I, you know, and I should be clear that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I want to be a particular kind of skeptic, which is just, um, I don't want to be the kind of skeptic who says this stuff never works and never will, but I do want to, um, for people to kind of cool out a little bit about some of these things. So I right. think that, I mean, my guess is that gamification will work really well in certain kinds of domains and lessons, but that we shouldn't expect it to be able to work in all different kinds of domains and lessons. Yeah. As a sort of general purpose answer. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny. I'm like lensing in my current experience of, you know, my family's from Mexico. I've tried to learn Spanish many times and failed kind of remarkably, but enough to sort of remember many, many words, but not be able to speak the language. Um, and I finally am like, you know, with my son born, I'm like going back to the, you know, I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. you've got to be able to speak Spanish with this kid. You know, I, I, right. I don't want to make the same mistakes that were made with me, you know, and, well, um, and I'm hoping that, you know, I basically I'm hoping to find willpower via one of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a, that's, I, I find myself scared at my line of thought there. Um, because it's, it's kind of, it's a bit of magical thinking, right? You're just like, well, if I start doing this app and the app's going to remind me to do the thing, then mm -hmm. I'll do the thing. Uh, right. and you know, maybe it's better than nothing, but I'm not sure that it actually gets me to the educational goal that I have. Um, and, and, and one, I, that's like a, yeah. One piece of advice I would give you, uh, for, uh, with your baby is, um, as sort of, as the years go on is to make sure that you work in some, uh, some peer reinforcement of Spanish, because in, mm -hmm. in fact, like when it, when it comes to natively bilingual children, uh, a lot of the research indicates that, uh, just having parents who speak both of the languages at home, is insufficient. They need peer reinforcement. Huh. And it's it's funny that because that kind of connects with what we're saying, which is one of the things that's really important in these kind of educational technology studies is sort of, you know, whether your peers are kind of buying into it has tends to have a lot to do with uh, uh, whether you buy into it. So I worked as a research assistant for someone who's working on a, uh, <clears throat> a sort of online writing network, um, which was a sort of a set of, of technologies trying to use sort of social media to uh to help facilitate student writing um mm -hmm. and i should say that like i you know i came to the project as kind of a skeptic because i mean one of the things that i think leads us in astray is sort of the uh, thinking well social networks are hot with the kids these days so let's make a social network for algebra and that way we'll solve all our algebra problems you know but yeah. anyway in the in the very preliminary findings of this first round of piloting uh that was done um you know, there was a sort of uh, snowball effect where in the classrooms where enough of the students sort of caught on to this technology and cared about it and gotten invested in it, pretty much everybody did. But um, if that sort of threshold was never met early on, uh, it, 
they sort of never, they never got there, right? Because everybody thought it was kind of dorky to use this technology. Right. And in fairness, when I was in high school, if you had given me that, I would have thought it was the least cool thing in the world. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The, and so yeah. these things are these things are all embedded in these social practices. What uh, you know, what I really want is. I would just like I, I I get that it's very necessary for the economics of the tech press to be able to sell stories and to catch people's attention when they're uh, scrolling through their Facebook and they're wondering you know if they're going to mm-hmm. click on that link or not and I get it. Um, I think that you can both do that right and talk about like this is going to be the best cell phone in history, but while sort of respecting. We're sort of developing a comfortable skepticism to a lot of the claims um, that people make about how technology is going to change our lives. You know, one of my favorite websites is uh, Paleo Future, uh, Matt Novak, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is which is part of Gawker Media now. And one of the things that he, his site does really well is show that we're not really good at futurism as a species. You know, like we right, we, right. we we make all these con- sort of consistently the same mistakes. And that's okay, right? Like it's like I I think it's fun to think about what the future is going to be, but we should sort of look at and say, okay, if in and I and I have somewhere I can dig out. Um, there's this article about how someday every classroom is going to have a television, and that right. is going to and that'll be the end of the teacher, right? Like the idea was you you just pop in a video every day, and that will make sure everyone gets the same education. And it's funny because it so perfectly predicts what people said about having an internet enabled computer in the classroom. And so Mm -hmm. I just want to generate more skepticism about those things out of a, out of sort of just like an intuitive sense that, Oh, Hey, wait a minute. Five years ago, I was reading the same tech bloggers saying this amazing thing is going to change my life. It's five years later. And they're saying this amazing thing is going to change my life. And my life is kind of just my life still, you know? Yeah, my cell phone yeah. can do a lot of a lot of cool things. Like that is progress. Like I, you know, my cell phone is just much better now, and a lot of things are a lot more useful and intuitive. But at the end of the day, it's a category error to think that these technologies are going to solve some of the problems that we think they're going to solve. That's it's funny too because my other my other lens for these things. And my dad works at my old middle school um, mm-hmm. where I came. Well, you know, it, it, it's a it's a middle of the road middle school. Um, both within the state of Washington and more broadly. And um, he works with two math teachers. Uh, he's like a teacher's assistant in the in the room. And mm-hmm. one of them is like young, super pro technology, tons of like Khan Academy, tons of, the, you know, the kids email him and there's all this stuff. And the other guy is like old school, you know, he just like mm-hmm. paper, lecture, you know, overheads, you know, uh, all that stuff. And so, you know, my dad is quite taken, my dad, of course, being the person who got me into technology, is quite taken with um, the, the technological sophistication of the, of the young guy. Um, and he just kind of thinks it's cool that there's all these videos and they communicate in these new ways. Um, and, but when I asked him, I was like, well, you know, what about like the performance of the kids? Like, do you notice any differences between, you know, is something working better? Is one method working better than the other? And like, it's totally unclear, like maybe not, maybe so it's like, but there's, it's certainly not in any way clear cut that the like just massive difference in technological sophistication of the teachers is actually having a massive difference in the outcomes for the students. Um, And for me, it's just like, it is an N equals two kind of miniature of this entire debate, <laughs> right? Um, it, which it is looks interesting. Be- I mean, it's interesting you talk about math, right? Because one of the things that will strike anybody who spends time in like a like a collegiate math department where they're doing like research math, right? So, like, I've been I've been taking statistics classes at, at Purdue for a little while now, and uh, uh, and I'm a little bit out of my element. I, I really enjoy them, but you know, so I'm interacting with these sort of math uh, people, and um, it's so funny because the most sort of rigorously and purely quantitative of the sciences, mathematics. Um, that's where I would say like, they kind of have like culturally a very kind of Luddite kind of yeah. attitude where they really don't in- introduce a lot of technology into, at least into their graduate teaching. And because there is a, there is a, a sort of culture and a philosophy of it's, it's the concepts and not the delivery. Mm-hmm. And you either are going to be able to figure out calculus or you're not. And it's just so funny to me that 
they have so little kind of integration with technology. I mean, in the humanities over in my building, you know, everybody is desperate to get tech into their classroom mm -hmm. because they think they think it's the way that they're going to produce more majors and that they'll get more funding from the university. But in math, uh, it it's really an old school kind of sensibility of, you know, I'm going to put the, these formulas on the board and you better catch up to it. And if you don't, that's your problem and not mine, you know. <laughs> I sometimes wondered if that's be also because like the input, you know, when you have a lot of symbols, et cetera, like the input methods are so clunky that it gets in the way of what you're actually trying to trying to do, particularly at the higher levels where there's like more stuff. Um, but it's also, I think you're probably right, that it's also the, the culture of the of the institutions are like, do it in here. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, I just yeah. pointed to my head, which I just realized you couldn't see. Um, so I, uh, I so I was maybe just to transition a little bit. Um, yeah, I know that you have a, a an interest in uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, I thought that this would be a good way to take this conversation because, um, well, so for one thing, your magazine published last year a, a, just a fantastic profile of Douglas Hostetter, who's at uh, IU at, in, at Indiana, which I really I. Um, a friend of mine is teaching a tech writing class uh, this fall, and he's uh, going to incorporate that into his syllabus, just mm -hmm. like a model of how to do like science journalism. Totally. Um, and to me, this is this has become kind of a. I mean, I've always had kind of an amateur interest in AI, but I'm more and more it's sort of impacting my research because uh, I use these sort of computerized natural language processing systems more and more, and I'm learning more and more about them in the sort mm -hmm. of. Uh, mathematical sense and statistical sense and computer science sense. And I'm frequently sort of struck by a very real and genuine ad admiration for the people who sort of make these systems. And yet uh, a kind of uh, frustration with how they're discussed because uh, there is what seems to me to be sort of a slippage between what we think of as like artificial intelligence of like human-like intelligence Mm -hmm. and human-like understanding and what these systems are actually doing. And yep. so that, that, that profile that uh, you guys ran is, is just about this, um, this, this sort of debate, which is, uh, I guess, just to, for me to give the quick, sort of quick rundown of it, you yeah. know, traditional artificial intelligence and how it's defined by someone like Doug Hofstetter um, is using computers to sort of approximate or substantially approximate the mental processes that human beings mm -hmm. use. Um, and this model has sort of famously kind of gone adrift um, because it's really hard, um, but also because we have these kind of Google models now, um, which are probabilistic systems. So if you look mm -hmm. at a system like Google Translate, which is, you know, uh, a system that millions of people use every day. And again, like that's a super powerful system and I admire it really well. But the way that Google Translate works is it's not even attempting to sort of come up with a theory of how human brains decode language. It's all probabilistic. So they use these Bayesian statistics, which if you've never heard of Bayesian statistics, you can think of them as like uh, like trainable statistics. They're statistics that use these giant data sets and every piece of data uh, they refine the model a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And so when you type in a string of characters into Google Translate, uh, it's not saying sort of, okay, how, what's the human mental process mm -hmm. that is used to sort of derive what this means, but rather they look at their vast set of data and we're talking billions of characters now. Um, and when we got a string like this in the past, uh, what is the most likely, using these Bayesian probabilities, what is the most likely way that it was translated? Um, and so that's kind of, you know, people use different ways to talk about that. Some people call that a kind of like an engineering approach to artificial intelligence rather than mm -hmm. a sort of computational approach or whatever. Um, so for someone like Hofstetter and I guess someone like me, um, I find that system really interesting, but it's a category error to think of that as artificial intelligence in the way that it traditionally meant. Right. And I, and I think that is, I, I think I'm, pro I'm probably in the same camp. Um, although I think there was, I, there's a guy, this is like, totally random, but it's turned out to be one of the most useful connections I've ever made. Uh, there, I go to a coffee shop near here. The guy with a, who always brings his daughter in about the same time I bring my son in, 
And it turns out he's a computational neuroscientist from MIT. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and he's, a, he's very interested in, um, in breaking down what we say. And this is from actually a different angle of criticism than, than the Hofstadter side. Um, he's interested in breaking down the, the phrase that this computer works like a brain, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of this sort of fundamental underlying concept of calling things artificial intelligence, I think, most of the time, is to say that there's some brain-like aspects to this thing. And I think the, the, the line of criticism that he has made um, about this way of thinking that I think is like super smart and a really useful tool for thinking about this topic is, you know, we, we know lots of things about the brain, at least that sort of an individual neuron and maybe, you know, kind of the way the visual systems are kind of patched together. Um, and, you know, certain regions of the brain that are comprised of like sort of large numbers of, um, of neurons. And we know that this sort of cortex is layered and we know that it makes these sort of predictions. And then the sensors of, that are our eyes are sort of used for sort of error correction on the models that our brains are building. So we know or at least have fairly strong hypotheses about some of these things. Um, but what we don't know is how far we need to sort of, this is the sort of X axis and, uh, and that is sort of biological realism. And then the Y axis is, is sort of behavioral realism or sort of more human like intelligence um, or, or more intelligence, no matter what it is, but, but basically more human like intelligence. We don't know how far we have to go right along the biological axis to go up a certain amount um, on the y-axis um, right. on sort of behavioral realism. And right. he could break down in much more specific ways, like all the various ways in which that might be true. Um, but like a, a really interesting or a kind of illuminating example for me is you know when when people build and I'm thinking here like deep learning networks um, things that kind of Google has been using to like identify a cat in like a YouTube still right these kind of these are like the most brain like of of these things he probably slapped me for saying that but it's like they're they're the things that are are touted as the most brain like of our sort of computing apparatuses and mm -hmm. I feel like um, uh, uh, in those sort of networks and those sort of learning networks, they sort of, they build these sort of probabilities and they kind of, they kind of work like neurons or sort of, they, they have this whole, um, the, the networks of probabilities strengthen based on input. And so you, you start building these statistical relationships between um, these sort of processing centers. And one thing that he's, that he's noted to me that just shows how different a biological system really is in all those deep learning systems. It's sort of on or off. It's sort of like a binary, um, uh, activation pattern, excitement pattern. Whereas if you look at the actual like spike patterns of cells, they're like incredibly complicated mm -hmm. and they, to be able to create systems that, um, more quickly and, and that work more efficiently and that just suck in lots of, uh, of data and spit out, you know, economically useful things, um, just like abstract out all that kind of biological uh, complexity. And so I think that those like, sort of, that's the sort of critique that I've been like most interested in recently. And there's also um, the, the De Boer Summers critique too, which is that we're not even trying to use these things to understand the way that we think or to produce intelligences that, um, basically that we can like use to understand ourselves um, right. and, and that we'll understand the world like us. Uh, I mean, it, and I think those two things together for me form like a pretty powerful critique of a lot of current talk around artificial intelligence um, because it's both the, the, the ends are perhaps not what we'd want them to be. And the means are perhaps, um, fuzzier and um and more overblown than um than we think right you know it's i think it's important to say like the kind of ai skeptic that i'm not which i mean like when you bring up the the, the topic of the wetware i think it's very important because um i'm a i mean i'm a materialist and you know i don't believe in a soul or whatever so what the you know what the 
whatever the relationship between the brain and the mind is, there is something physiological and anatomical and physical happening here that it should, should certainly be capable of being replicated at some point in the mm -hmm. future. And I'm not the kind of skeptic to say computers will never do X. I just think that that's just a losing bet, you know, uh, unless we destroyed the world with global warming beforehand. Uh, right, right. And I, it's interesting. I got into a, a really a, a deep email conversation with a computer scientist after I published a piece on AI on my blog. And yeah, he had referred to. I read that. Yeah, yeah. He read. Uh, he he mentioned. He he called uh, Doug Hofstadter a, a sort of an AI skeptic. And I had to say, well, I mean, Hofstadter's not an AI skeptic, right? He's one of the most enthusiastic sort of uh, guys about AI as a concept it, it we've ever had. He's a, a skeptic about our current path to try to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what I've heard, yeah. sort of. I mean, what I've heard in sort of the, def the defense that makes the most sense to me of the kind of sort of Peter Norvig, who's the head of um, mm -hmm. of Google's AI uh, department, who is just, a, I mean, he's a god at this stuff. And, and a, a guy who's actually very ecumenical, by the way, about criticisms of, of this approach. Um, but the, the sort of the defense of this kind of probabilistic sort of Bayesian approach um, that, that makes the most sense to me is when people say, well, you know, these systems were never kind of really designed to think the way that humans think. They're simply sort of designed to solve certain human problems. Um, and, and I get that. And again, like I use Google Translate all the time. Um, mm -hmm. My response to that is that you have to understand uh, within linguistics, you know, these systems are such an enormous sort of attention and energy mm -hmm. and money suck that my fear is that there's not sufficient attention paid to the old school kind of cognitive science in a lot of ways. And I mean, if you think mm -hmm. about it, if you're a bright and ambitious young linguist and you look at the current state of the job market in the, in the academy and you look at how hard it is to secure funding, even at very prestigious programs now, um, you know, I would never blame anyone who said, I'm going to go in the kind of Google direction because I'll have more outs for getting a job someplace. It's some tech company that needs people who do natural language processing. And there's always money out there um, because these mm -hmm. have these sort of direct and profitable applications. I don't, I don't blame people for doing that. But I really think that we just sort of do a disservice to human knowledge if we allow the sort of all of the attention and money to flow in that one direction. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, particularly given that, I think the, the question that I've had, and, and I, I can't even pretend to be the person who can answer this, is whether that Google strategy, just throw more data at it, throw more data at it, throw more data mm -hmm. at it, um, engage in like just absurd data collection practices in order to do that. Um, and I'll talk about one of those in just a second. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not that actually gets you to what is interesting about AI, which is human level artificial intelligence. It's some, it's right. a non human intelligence that we can communicate with, um, in some way that talks back to us. I mean, this is the, this is the dream and it's also the sort of, it is the era making, um, uh, I don't even know if I'm supposed to call it an invention, innovation, something it's, it is, if you have something like that, that is the thing. And it's, it does seem unclear to me whether or not you need to go with some other approach, whether that's like the hosh data approach or other ones that I'm not aware of, or if you can just truly plow so much data. And, and I'll just give one uh, short example. I, I just, I rode in a Google car earlier this week for the first mm. time. Wow. Um, which is kind of interesting. I mean, it went around like Mountain View, California, you know, suburb. It's like pretty boring. <laughs> it's like, um, but it did all the things that you would expect. I mean, including like making left-hand turns and uncontrolled, you know, intersections with like nine lanes of, uh, of road and dealing with railroads and uh, bicyclists and pedestrians and people cutting you off and all this stuff. It dealt with all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And what was fascinating is that when, when, you, when you look at how it is that Google has been able to do this, you know, because there are other car makers working on this stuff, but they're basically doing freeway, um, like cruise control, basically keeping your speed. Um, it, it's mostly a speed and collision avoidance thing on the sort of on the freeway, which is itself a kind of controlled environment. Um, 
and they Google themselves will say that it's like a hundred times harder or more to do uh, street level driving. And I think, you know, if you look at the, what the automakers are doing, none of them are trying to even attempting to do this. And so I always wondered, like, I was like, God, is it just that like Google has this incredible machine vision people and they can like figure it all out? It turns out, and this is just so fascinating to me, that basically what they've done is turn Mountain View into like a virtual world that the cars can drive around in. Um, they, before they can go anywhere in a Google car in automated mode, they have to drive it multiple times manually. And they're building these, this like incredibly detailed model of the world. Um, and then the sensors on the car are just to detect deviations from what it expects, this like incredibly um, detailed data uh, about the physical world and, and moving vehicles. But if you think about it, if they want to roll out driverless cars across the country, there's 4 million miles of road um, in the United States. They'd have to drive all those things multiple times with the most sophisticated cars on earth. And Google is just like, oh, okay. The, the actual quote from the head of the Google driverless car um, uh, program was, he literally said, it's work, and then he shrugged. But it's not intimidating work, is what he said. <laughs> but like, think about, but that think about what that means, right? Yeah. I mean, think about yeah. what that means in terms of comparison to your average uh, 16-year-old driver who just got his driver's license, right? Now, maybe, I mean, I will, I will 100% agree that I think that, um, I mean, I, I want to see the era of, era of self-driving cars get here because I think there's going to be far less uh, car accidents and a lot of saved lives because of this stuff, because I just think that computers are going to be better at this someday than we are mm -hmm. now. But yeah. think about, think about sort of the requirement to sort of drive around in a new place. If you need to do that much training, right. In mm -hmm. order to get these cars ready for those roads. Well, I can take a, that 16 year old and I can take him if he's learned <laughs> yeah. to drive in Montana, right. <laughs> I can move him to Georgia and I can set him loose in the streets and he'll be, he'll do, you know, maybe a little bit worse, but he will adapt in a much more sort of intuitive fashion. And of course, Definitely. you know, he'll need to be trained too, right? If you, if you put him in Manhattan, he'll probably uh, run screaming from the car, but there's a sense in which we can understand that the kid doesn't have to build like a perfect mental model of everywhere that he goes in order to understand the processes that are underneath driving. Yep. For, for the broader question of, you know, can we just continue to throw data at these, at these questions? Again, Peter Norvig, who is like, who was the guy for this stuff. He is very upfront in saying that it's a big open question, particularly with mm -hmm. natural language processing, whether you can just continue to add more data without getting some kind of a plateau effect. And, and I can't say this with anything resembling like, uh, I can't say this with great strength, but I, you know, I know a bunch of people in natural language processing who do work with Google translate. And a lot of them will tell you that it, it's gotten much better on a sort of phrase level and on a, a sentence level up to a certain level of complexity, but that at the passage level, I mean, you can go and you can grab a big long ch chunk of something and plug it into Google translate yourself. And if it's not something that many people have tried to translate before, mm -hmm. your results are not going to be that good. And the question is, is do we get this plateau effect? Um, so and just to, to briefly, because we uh, want to run up, wrap up before too long, just to yeah. sort of talk just a little bit about like the kind of systems that I'm talking about and that I encounter in my research. So Yeah, totally. I'd love so to. Like, so like, uh, look at something called the latent semantic analysis. So latent semantic analysis is... Um, uh, a sort of application within the broader field of what we call vectorial semantics. And mm -hmm. uh, the idea here is that we can uh, create processes whereby computers can understand meanings. So that's where the semantic comes from mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. by the relationship of words with each other. And so what it does is we, we train these, um, these models with giant sets of data and um, using what's called a decomposition matrix, which is just a, a sort of a mathematical relationship between these different words that changes based uh, on their, their relative position to each other and their relative rarity, the computer, after a lot of training, can identify substitutions and synonyms um, mm -hmm. that 
approximates what a human being would do. So in other words, after you train the sophisticated lexical semantic analysis uh, program with a large enough data set, um, it can do a pretty good job of guessing what a human being would choose as a synonym on a list, right? So mm -hmm. you, you, you take a word that has been shown up enough times in this training corpus and you give it a list of like four or five words and then you compare how closely the computer matches words from from these sort of spatial relationships to uh, what uh, a human being does. And they do pretty good and they, you know, they get into, into mm -hmm. agreements in like the high eights. They also have they can pull out just these totally bizarre mistakes, right? Um, now, it, the question is, is like, what is this system for? Um, again, like the people who do this work, if, I mean, if you're interested in lexical semantic analysis, anybody watching at mm -hmm. home, like University of Colorado is where a lot of this is coming out of. Um, huh. It's it's incredible, incredible work. And I'm, I'm so impressed by what they do. But I talk to people at conferences or online and... Uh, People can sometimes be kind of evangelistic about this. And one of the things that a lot of people involved in LSA are say is like, this is, you know, this substantially approximates the way that human beings understand words. And I just yeah. don't think that that's true, right? Like I just, I, you know, if you take a child, you know, who knows that there's a relationship between peanut butter and jelly, right? It's true that they've seen the word peanut butter and jelly, that those words co-occur a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but they also understand underneath that sort of co-occurrence, why they co-occur. And they have a particular conceptual understanding of what it means mm -hmm. to of something to be jelly and what it means to be peanut butter. They know why they tend to show up together. They know mm -hmm. that they have a similarity that's not shared by bread, right? Which is also sort of, which also co-occurs. And that mm -hmm. bread, jelly, and peanut butter have a similarity that's not shared by the word sandwich, right? Um mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to me, I don't understand the thing that sort of consistent frustration is I don't understand why it's necessary to say that these are substantially similar, like that LSA works in the same way as the human brain does. I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I find these systems super useful and super interesting and super cool just from like a, a sort right. of linguistics geek standpoint. But people get very, <laughs> are very aggressive and sort of wanting to say that these things are the same. Um, I mean, like one mm -hmm. thing I hear all the time is, you know, oh, you, you just don't think that it's thinking that way because of your theoretical priors, which is like a thing, it's like a code for it's insuffic insufficiently empirical. Um, and so, and so I guess to sort of bring this back to the, be to huh. the beginning, the sort of hype cycle that we talked about a little bit earlier in a tech press is uniquely vulnerable, right? To misunderstanding this kind of nuanced difference, right? <laughs> yeah. So if yeah, I, yeah. when I talk about like latent semantic analysis, um, making the mistake of seeing how powerful it is and how predictive it is, but associating that with human-like understanding, that's exactly the kind of mistake that the tech press is likely to make. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I do. I do. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, a big part of it is just like we don't have, I, I believe this anyway, we don't really have language to describe um other the way other things think basically mm -hmm. we 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 use think we use verbs like see to say what the google car is doing because it's just kind of like what's to hand but we mm -hmm. we really we don't understand that at all like right. we don't we don't know what those words mean in that context but they're sort of the best that we have mm -hmm. and i think the combination of that problem um with a lack of like real technical understanding that basically every pretty much every single journalist who ever writes about these things, they're not actually going to know what's going on inside the box, even if they had the theoretical ability mm -hmm. to do that um, because the companies would never tell them. So you're kind of, you're kind of lensing in from the outside that you don't have the right language. And at the end of the day, your paycheck depends on people being really excited about technology. <laughs> it's like, right. it is a very bad um, combination. And I think, um, you know, I think the only, I only can speak to a solution for myself on this particular topic, um, but it basically comes down to um, doing, finding the time to do a few deeply reported things 
in among all the other stuff that you're doing so that you go deep enough in something that you know the the unknown unknowns you know right so that you just you you know what you don't know right and i think that's that is a it's a it's kind of the only i think thing that we can hope that journalists um in this space will do and um if there's one great thing about some of the new models like the verge or or 538 or whatever some of these other things it's that they do let their people go deep on things sometimes and i think mm -hmm. that the sort of the stock value uh of, of your journalism goes up when you take the time to learn something deeply even if you're going to bounce off to something else after that right I guess my, what I would, uh, the, the one thing that I would like to sort of, uh, the idea that I would like to sort of distribute out there to anyone who writes about AI is to understand that the kind of problems that we're talking about um, are not sort of, it can't be solved by more processing power. They're not processing power mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mentioned this um, in a piece before, but, you know, it's just a category error to think my cell phone is four times as fast as the one that I got two years ago. Ergo, you know, we're going to get this, you know, Google's going to become an intelligent being or something like that. Um, <laughs> you know, so in, uh, in Godel Escher Bach, uh, Hofstetter writes, one of my favorite lines is, the peculiar flavor of uh, artificial intelligence uh, is that uh, it's using formal, I think it's, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, it's using formal statements to teach an inflexible machine how to be flexible, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, pro programming is all about, is still all about sort of if this, then that. And that is not something that you can just throw more processing power at. I mean, we, we don't have time to go into it, but you know, yeah. one of the, one yeah. of the things that he, that, that he talks about all the time is, um, you know, two things that the human brain do, does very, very well is negotiating paradox and negotiating ambiguity. And those are two things that computers don't do well. And that's a software problem that has to come from people figuring things out and from coding. And it can't just come from throwing more processing power at things. Totally. And if I, you know, I have my concluding um, thing will be that I, I hope that we see more um, more biologists becoming involved in this or more computer scientists taking interest in the biology because I think mm. there's, um, there's just an enormous amount to be learned there. And, um, and we need, to, we actually need new technologies to be able to examine the brain. And there's some people out right. there working on that kind of stuff. Um, the, the very last thing that I'll say, um, is that if you want to see, like just kind of an uncannily strange product right now. There's there's a, a non-commercial product just called Deep Belief out there from a company called Jetpack. And basically it is a demonstration of a really um, simple um, machine, like deep learning, as they would call it, deep learning um, algorithm at work, where you basically you put it on your phone, you point it at a class of object or an object, and then you use it to identify other ones of that object, other things mm. of that class. And so I trained it on the roses in my front yard. And um, it literally, you know, you just kind of like hold your camera in front of different roses at different, uh, uh, in front of the same rows, different angles. And then I went around to all the other roses in my yard and saw it to see if it could pick them up, but discriminated against other um, flowers. Mm. And in fact, it picked up the roses not nice. the other flowers, with the exception of the white roses, which it, it couldn't pick up. But it was just it, it just kind of blew my mind because it was literally one minute of training uh, mm -hmm. to create a rose detector that preferentially selected only roses and not other flowers, which is like kind of absurd. It's um, super cool when you think about it. Um, so anyway, it, I, I feel like for me, that's how I remain excited despite yeah. all of the um, critiquing and kind of. Uh, I'm just sort of critical thinking that we're bringing to these things. These things are still exciting. Oh, just, totally. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me finish this up by, I'll, yeah. I'll give you the reason why I think that it's reasonable to be a sort of, I mean, I, I guess I'll call myself an optimistic skeptic, right? Like I'm skeptical about where we are right now. But I, I think that, I think that someday if we, if we last that long, humanity will produce human like artificial intelligence. Let me give it like a quick anecdote for why yeah. it's no, for why it's no insult to, to say that we are nowhere near a, machine that can really process language the way that human beings can. So yeah. um, 
And I'll give the example of Nicaraguan Sign Language. So uh, up until the late 1970s, uh, there was essentially no kind of organized services for the deaf uh, in Nicaragua. Uh, so uh, in something like I think 1977, uh, they decided to address this and they opened a series of schools, mm -hmm. uh, one very large school in particular. And uh, but they had very harsh rules for the students. And what they said was that um, the way that the students were to communicate was to read lips in Spanish. Um, and to, uh, if they had to sign, they were only allowed to uh, hand sign letters. So not a sign language in the sense of indicating words with your hands, but by making individual letters, spelling things out in Spanish, which is mm -hmm. horribly inefficient. And it's just not a good way to communicate. Well, so what happened was a few hundred of these children, um, created their own sign language, uh, with, even though the the staff of the school was actively trying to suppress it. So a couple hundred school children, uh, many of whom had come from homes with abuse and neglect, uh, some of whom had developmental and cognitive disabilities, um, and all of whom had grown up in sort of linguistically deprived environments. They spontaneously generated a human, a functioning human grammar in the course of a couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's what the human natural language capacity can do. Uh, I think that it's, yeah. um, if we think of it as a sort of system of distributed cognition, it's the most powerful information processing system that's ever existed on earth. So it's no insult if I say that I don't think right. we're anywhere close, right? <laughs> a, a machine right. that can do that is an incredibly powerful thing and it's going to take us a long time, but, uh, I think someday we'll get there. So, yeah, cool. Cool. Hey, Freddie, thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. It's been awesome. Hey. Great to talk to you, Alexis. Thanks a lot. Awesome. All right. Talk Later. to you soon. Later, man.